Now is it on? Oh, look. Amazing what happens when you turn things on. How's everybody doing? Sleepy yet? Back on the time zones? Figured out? It's been a good week, I think. Great content so far in the show. Thanks for joining me. So I'm Jesse Proudman, CTO of Blue Box. You can follow me on Twitter at Blue Box Jesse. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the death of the distro and the future of OpenStack. My belief in where the future of OpenStack is headed from a service provider perspective, how we make organizations the most successful with OpenStack. So I'd like to start back at the beginning, way back in 2010 when OpenStack was born. Projects was initiated from Rackspace and NASA, and it was designed to create an agile infrastructure platform to make deployments of VMs more easy. Sonova and Swift were the foundation. It's an important foundation. We need, uh, we need compute. Obviously, we're going to have a cloud, although today you might argue that it would be containers. But back then, we needed compute. Object storage, I think, was an interesting choice. But uh, com going, compared to what was going on with Amazon at the time, but Swift was a great contribution and, and a great set of code and arguably some of the most uh, reliable and some of the best code in the OpenStack project today along with Nova. But we were missing quite a lot. We were missing block storage. If we looked at what was going in, in EBS with Amazon, we were missing installation capabilities, upgrade capabilities, orchestration capabilities, monitoring, logging, all of these pieces that it takes to actually run and operate an OpenStack environment weren't in the original set of code. And that's fine, because it's an open source project, and we got to start somewhere. Uh, and that gap left a market opportunity, left a market opportunity for organizations. And so we all jumped in. A bunch of vendors said, hey, here's, here's an opportunity to fix a problem. How do you make money in this business? You find something that's painful, and you solve it and you solve it in the most reliable and simple way, and you provide a great experience doing that. And so the distribution was born. People looked at OpenStack, all of the different pieces and bits and services and that you need to actually deploy and operate one of these clouds, and realized to some extent it was a huge set of spaghetti. You look at just Python dependency management to get all the OpenStack pieces working? How do I track each individual, individual specific version of each individual specific Python library for each individual specific project? And that becomes a giant pain. And you've got to do that not just against Python and all those libraries, but the database engine, the message bus, all of the additional services that you need. And if you think about it, there was no HA in OpenStack when it was born. So People had to figure out, how do I take this single service and make it highly available? Because what's a cloud if the control plane isn't highly available? It's useless. So the distribution was born. OpenStack is hard. It moves very, very quickly. And we have a lot of debate about this. We're on a six-month release cycle today, uh, which if you think about from an enterprise perspective, that, that's insanely fast. If you think about it from a public cloud perspective, it's insanely slow. Uh, but it moves quickly, and it is growing at an ever-increasing rate. So not only do you have a fast-moving project, but you have an ever-expanding project with ever-expanding complexity. That's a challenging problem. It's a distributed system. Distributed systems are hard. It's very difficult to find application engineers, period. It's harder to find application engineers who understand distributed systems. And it's even harder to understand application engineers than understand Python distributed systems and OpenStack. It's a talent crunch. We're all aware of that. Anybody who's working in the space, whether they're trying to hire talent or they are an engineer and are being approached by 50,000 recruiters at every summit, it's a difficult space. Uh, and that makes OpenStack itself even more difficult. Python. Python's actually not too difficult, but it's a unique skill. And it's one that, much like that application engineer pro problem, you've got to go find the people that understand the language that this technology is written in. And then lastly, time. So all of these things are solvable with time, but nobody has any time, right? Time is the most valuable 
resource to any organization, more, more so than money, because time is money to these organizations. And the whole point of adopting a cloud platform is to increase an organization's velocity and increase an organization's agility. And if I'm now taking my best engineers in my organization and having them focus to learn all of these pieces, how am I actually benefiting my organization? What business difference am I making? So that was a big challenge. So how, how if we go back to 2013, how are we going to solve that? Well, very early on, there were very few organizations that actually had patience for all of those components. Many organizations are saying, look, this is, this is very different from how I'm used to delivering my IT. I have VMware, and I use, put a ticket in, and then two weeks later, I read your ticket, and I create the VM, and I hand you back credentials, and we're good to go. Or maybe we're out of capacity, so it takes me four months to buy another server from Dell and put it in the data center, and maybe it didn't work. And, but it works. Like That's how we've done it for years, and that's how we're comfortable doing it. So why would I try this whole new thing that's, that's very difficult? particularly when I don't have time to learn all the skills. Isn't there a faster way? Can't we have the pudding without eating meat first? Like people just were trying to experiment and figure out what we were going to do. So around the Diablo and Essex release, uh, timing's approximate, a bunch of smart people had a great idea. If we could simplify all those pieces of OpenStack, the velocity challenge, Python, all the dependency management, and we could provide more choice than just taking the source and using that, or going to Rackspace and getting a public cloud account on OpenStack, there might be a business opportunity there. That's a problem. That's a challenge. We think people might be willing to pay for that. And so with that in mind, the OpenStack distribution was born. And we saw a lot of great companies come in very early. And the, um, they packaged everything in a way that, that was meaningful. Then the C came pouring in. So we had a bunch of independents. Many of those were uh, companies that were founded by folks originally involved in the creation of the OpenStack source code to begin with. Then the C came pouring in. We have Red Hat, SUSE, HP, uh, Ubuntu, Can or Canonical. Everybody started making an OpenStack distribution. That was the popular hip thing to do. IBM had an, uh, an OpenStack distribution. If you actually look, if you go to the OpenStack Foundation website, they have a marketplace. And that marketplace lists all the vendors that sell OpenStack services. So go to this website, click on Marketplace, click on Distributions. I think there's like 27 different software distributions listed there from different vendors. So 27 people taking the exact same source code, packaging it, and trying to sell it as something that's differentiated and adds value. And that's a pretty, pretty uh, thick market. And at the end of the day, You've got to convince me that that's, that's the right approach. We can look at the history of some of those companies. The three I, I show that started aren't in existence anymore. Cloud Scaling was acquired. Piston was acquired. Nebula was unfortunately went out of business. Now uh, that team's part of Oracle. Not working on OpenStack. Uh, so that model feels flawed. And you look at some of the, the challenges in the other major enterprise OpenStack distribution vendors. Nobody is sort of shouting from the rooftop that OpenStack is driving material portions of the revenue. So people are using these distributions. It's not as if they are going unused. But that, that wasn't sort of this panacea to generate revenue from OpenStack. If you look at 451 Research every year does something called the OpenStack Pulse. And they take, they survey all the OpenStack vendors. And they ask, how much money are you generating? What do your projections look like? And from that, they put together this forecast of, of what the market will look like. And OpenStack, uh, I think in 2017 or 2018, I'm going to get this totally wrong, but it's something like $3 billion projected in the market. And the interesting thing about that study is actually that the bulk of the revenue there is derived from service providers, not from software distributions, not from sort of networking plug-in companies, not from all these, these individual peak monitoring companies or tooling companies or configuration management, but from service providers. So something there tells me that software approach isn't, isn't what the market's asking for. But distros did solve some of the problems. Installation got faster. Commercially licensed bits and some of the distributions filled holes that existed in OpenStack for various components. Think billing or metering or telemetry or monitoring. Uh, and they provided software support, which is, is helpful. It's helpful to have somebody that knows what they're doing who can answer your questions. 
So if I call Red Hat and my system's down, they can say, hey, here's three or four things you can go try. That's a, that's a benefit, and it's worth some amount of money. Uh, but I don't think that they solved enough of the problems. So many of the distributions, I call them open-ish, right? We, we're using OpenStack. The idea here is that each of the, each of the, or the bits are all uh, cross-compatible. The work we're doing, the foundation's doing with RefStack, I think is actually adding a ton of value here. But a lot of the early OpenStack distributions had enough proprietary capabilities in them that they weren't really open. They weren't open source. You couldn't go get the pieces without paying, paying for them on many of them. Operations was a huge challenge. So installing the cloud, like that's, that's a solved problem to a large extent now. Many people can go install OpenStack. It's the Sunday morning at 3 a.m. problem when that cloud falls over that really is the painful part. And we think about the Linux distribution. When Sunday morning at 3 a.m. you had a server fall over with your Linux distribution and you needed help, okay, you called the, the software vendor, you were able to get some assistance, maybe you changed some setting, and they kind of generally fixed your thing, or maybe they didn't and you had to wait until Tuesday or whatever it was, but that was one system that was impacted. And if you've architected things, maybe you can fail over to another system. The business impact there wasn't as large. If you think about a cloud, that cloud generally begins to underpin everything you're doing in your business, which means the blast radius, when it fails, it takes out a lot more than that one system. And unless you're running two clouds and you're going to fail everything over to the other cloud, which is a, a ridiculous amount of work, that's a big problem. How do you limit that blast radius? Those people, that, that the organizations that used the open source initiatives or that used the distribution itself, that operations challenge became their problem. And it's a huge pain in the neck. The monitoring, the logging, the operations, the upgrades, those are all big challenges in OpenStack. And particularly when you think about all of the flexibility that was baked into those distributions. Marantis has done amazing work in the space. You go look at what they've done with Fuel, and you can literally use almost every networking plugin. You can install every OpenStack service. You can configure things in 14, 5,000 different ways. That's awesome. But how do you reliably upgrade that environment to the next version when you've got so many different configuration flags? It becomes a big, big challenge. And so it's that that's not how we do it here, upgrades. Like, all right, you turn this thing on, and we didn't have support for that driver version into the next version. Or, and we, we see, we've seen this a lot with Cinder drivers, where one Cinder driver and one version of OpenStack works great, and then you go to the next version of OpenStack, and the same driver that's commercially supported by the same storage vendor doesn't actually work uh, in the next version. So when you've got all of this flexibility, all of these options, that upgrade process becomes a, a huge challenge. We saw it in the keynotes on, uh, what day was that, Tuesday? I'm losing track of my days. The first day of keynotes, that uh, there was the, the cloud provider that had four different OpenStack clouds on four different versions of OpenStack going all the way back to Grizzly or, or earlier, Havana. Uh, so that, that's a, it's a big pain. And when we think about using OpenStack for the long term for our businesses, those are the things we need to be thinking about. How do we operate this environment? How do we make it reliable? How do we upgrade it? How do we make it survive more than just one single OpenStack release? So at the end of the day, the distribution model didn't convince me. I'm, I'm not convinced the distributions are the right way. Uh, and I think you, you begin to see that there are critical business barriers that block these open source deployments. Because these are big challenges that have open-ended questions, and it's hard to actually answer those in the marketplace. Or you began to see a bunch of these original, these original distribution-based installations fail. Remember a year or two ago, we would see all these articles about people saying, oh, I tried OpenStack and it didn't work. It failed. My installation failed down back on VMware. I went to a public cloud. That's a problem that's derived from that ongoing operations problem. And so you begin to see enough of these stories in the marketplace. And as an organization, you begin to lose the incentive to take that risk to go try that open source project. If you've got VMware in your installation and you're running everything there and it's working, what's the driver to go try something new? Particularly if all you read are articles that things are failing. Like that, it's a big challenge that, that we as a community had to work with. Uh, and it's one that I think still exists to a, lot of, to a large extent. We also didn't see 
if we back up a couple years, a lot of competitors, a lot of companies, competitors doing using these types of technologies. Those competitors were looking at other options in the marketplace. They were looking at public cloud providers. Uh, and so the market had time to wait. The market wasn't necessarily ready, and they had time to wait, so they did. And in the meantime, the public cloud vendors in the marketplace evolved very, very quickly. Because what do you get out of a public cloud? You get an experience. You get an SLA, and you get an API. You don't worry about what hardware to choose. You don't worry about what operating system to install. You don't worry about what distribution of public cloud do I buy and install in my thing. And you certainly don't worry about at 3 AM when the data center fails, how you're going to fix it. You worry about how you get your application back online. So it moves your spectrum of concern up to your application, not to the cloud itself. Uh, and so these are big challenges that, that OpenStack had, that private clouds had. Uh, and in the meantime, public cloud began to get more and more adoption. But OpenStack also began to evolve very, very rapidly. And evolve not just in the technology, but in ways to consume that technology. And while that change was happening, the market began to get more and more acceptance of OpenStack. So if we think uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, when you went to go talk to a CIO or a VP of infrastructure at these companies, nobody said, it was no longer, what is OpenStack? Everybody had heard of OpenStack. But the question became, how do I actually get going with OpenStack? How do I make sure that if I want to try this technology, I'm not going to have the same experience, the same failures, the same frustrations that I've read about in the news? More and more customers began to say, hey, can I consume OpenStack without actually having to touch OpenStack? And from a public cloud perspective, you had a lot of options. You had Rackspace. You had HP Public Cloud at that time. You had a bunch of vendors in Europe, smaller vendors that have started. I was just in China last week. And there are two or three uh, pretty material public clouds, pretty materially sized public clouds running on OpenStack. So there were ways to do it from a public cloud perspective. But that private cloud perspective, being able to put that environment in your data center next to your systems of record next to where all your data that you may want to actually interact with in the application you're building resides, there wasn't necessarily a solution there. And all about the same time, you started to see companies like MetaCloud and Bluebox come to market where we're doing this managed model. And more recently, you begin to see companies like Platform 9 or ZeroStack or, Easy, uh, or Zero Stack come to market. Uh, and the, the thinking about how we actually deploy and consume OpenStack in our data centers, we begin to get actual options there. So as OpenStack's evolving, as those, those different types of uh, consumption methodologies began evolving, a funny thing happened. Organizations realized that AWS wasn't a distraction. That public cloud thing wasn't going away. It's a, it's a, uh, a direction that next generation applications Will, will be written in cloud-native formats. That differentiation through infrastructure was a losing game. That I've got my data center, and I'm going to make my business successful because I'm going to operate that data center better than anybody else. That wasn't a viable strategy anymore. And that sustainable success for an organization rests in the software that they're building, not on the platform that they're building it on. And so as organizations began to realize that, they began to look for alternatives. How are we going to make this thing work? And at the same time, OpenStack continued to evolve. And we got into the Icehouse release. We got into the Juno release. And we started to recognize that, that OpenStack was ready, that OpenStack works. It was no longer a matter of the technology doesn't work, like we were struggling with in early versions, like I, it literally didn't work. But, it, uh, but that operation problem was still a challenge. And, and it wasn't it's not just me saying that. Like We start to see uh, Gartner. Uh, and for folks that don't follow the analyst community, Gartner has been one of the largest skeptics of OpenStack and his success uh, for a long time. So is OpenStack success, uh, a success? Sure it is. So Gartner is beginning to say, OK, there's something, there's something here to this technology. You've got uh, Forrester. Is OpenStack, or OpenStack is ready, are you? So that the analyst community is beginning to say, OpenStack is ready. I say OpenStack is ready. Gartner says it's ready. Forrester says it's ready. IDC says it's ready. Users say it's ready. The market says OpenStack is ready. The technology is there. The technology works. That solves customer problems. But the question continues to be, 
how do we make this work in our enterprise? And so there's an enterprise disconnect at the same time. Some folks and organizations were continuing to call it a science project. You continue to see articles about OpenStack failing. There was that nice article that came out last week about British Telecom and how they're ripping OpenStack out of their, their infrastructure. The whole article was kind of a, a misnomer since British Telecom was just experimenting with OpenStack, so there was nothing to rip out. They were saying, here's the things we think we need to see in the technology before we use it. But you see these articles. And I think, to some extent, the media likes to use OpenStack as a whipping horse because it's easy or has been easy. Uh, but we've been struggling with that, that installation and operations problems. So today, if, even if you've used the distribution, you've had to go hire, train, and build that installation. Or you can let somebody else do it for you. And so what we see is that most enterprises that we're talking with want to consume OpenStack without having to touch OpenStack. Most enterprises want a cloud, a cloud experience. And remember, what is a cloud? It's an experience, an SLA, and an API. Whether it's public or private, that's ultimately what, what we're looking for. And so some organizations have solved this, and they're rolling their own clouds. We see them at the keynotes. They're impressive numbers. You look at the things that CERN's doing. You look at the things that Walmart's doing, Target's doing, PayPal, eBay. Uh, these organizations are building engineering teams, big engineering teams, to focus on their installations. And for those companies, building that infrastructure is a differentiator for their business. But you look at many other organizations that are saying, look, ultimately all I want to do is deliver business value. I want to be able to build applications. I want solutions powered by my software that run on infrastructure, and I don't want to worry about that infrastructure. A few are using distros. Uh, We've seen that model work here or there. So it's not that distros won't ever work, right? But I think you have to go back and, and think about that first point. Do I have the expertise and the capability to actually fix and operate that environment when it fails? And we've seen a growing number of organizations now looking for an alternative, that managed model. So why are they looking for that managed model? Well, it's the complexity. It's the tooling. It's the operations challenge. But it's okay. They know those are challenges now. And that's making this, this as a service model even more successful. So you look at even Rackspace in the keynotes today. Their private cloud is listed as as a service. The, the uh, zero stack folks, they raised a Series A in this space six months ago, and they just raised a Series B. So investors are putting money into this managed model. That's a model that makes sense to organizations. So in closing, I think. Distributions are not the future of OpenStack. I think service providers are the, the future of OpenStack. And whether that's service providers from a public cloud perspective or service providers from a private cloud perspective, that's what will make the most material impact into the, the wide-scale adoption of OpenStack. I think a few distros will exist, maybe two, maybe three, certainly not 10 or 25 like we have today. Um, and it's, it's somewhat like the Linux distribution in its early days, that we had this huge fracturing uh, of the distribution, and each one had its own sort of special thing. But ultimately, the market uh, collapses onto a few options, and those options actually have differentiated value. You see that today between what's in Ubuntu or what's in Red Hat or what's in SUSE. Uh, I think business models will continue to evolve. So we saw the creation of do-it-yourself. We saw the creation of the distribution. We saw the creation of the appliance. We saw the creation of the as-a-service model. There will be future models uh, that, that come out to help customers adopt and use OpenStack. Uh, and I think that's, that's exciting. And at the end of the day, cloud will keep being cloudy. The things, things will change. We're in a market that is moving insanely quickly. And not just velocity, but the breadth of technology that we're using is increasing at an ever, uh, ever faster rate. Uh, and so it's hard to say what the future will hold. You've looked at what's happened in the last year, year alone, with Docker and containers and how that's transforming the industry. There will be future Dockers. There will be future change uh, in the marketplace. And so ultimately, I think it's the most exciting time. It's an exciting time to be working with cloud. It's an exciting time to be working with OpenStack. It's an exciting time to be in this space. It's why we're all here. It's why we come to these summits every six months, because this is a, it's a great technology to be working with. So I like to quote uh, Randy Bias, a good friend of mine. 
Uh, markets define standards. Customers will come, and they will ask for something, and they will expect it to work. And it's our job in the OpenStack community to respond to those requests and come up with a solution that works. It's also our job to figure out what they're not asking for and to figure out how we, we adopt and innovate in that blank space, in that space that, that isn't a solved problem today, whether it be from a commercial vendor or from an open source solution. So uh, with that, I will open it up to any questions. And if there are no questions, I'll give you a few minutes of your day back. And thanks for joining me. Yeah, great question. So if I'll summarize it for the video. So uh, there are service providers that have existed and have failed uh, because of the, complex, the same complexity that we all struggle with. Organizations need to decide, if I get rid of all the talent that I have that actually knows how to operate these environments, uh, how do I actually continue to innovate in the application space? Is that a fair summary? OK. So I believe that those individuals don't go away from an organization. You don't get rid of your team that knows how to operate things. You have them operate at a higher level of value in your organization. So your application developers are going to write, let's talk, about it. let's talk about a bank. Banks are, I mean, my bank three weeks ago rolled out a new mobile banking application. They had engineers in-house in working on that application, and they had to go deploy it and operate it in their environment. That environment surely connects back to the transaction system of record. The team that they have has to operate that environment. So they may have two teams, one operating the infrastructure to power that environment, and then the actual application itself. It's my belief that if you consolidate all that talent and technical expertise in the application delivery layer, you can be more successful. So instead of splitting your talent across doing something that, that ultimately isn't a core competency versus moving that core competency into something that actually brings you business value, you've got opportunity. The other thing I didn't note in the, in the talk that I think is important to that same, on that same line is that if you think about operations of a cloud environment from a single uh, customer perspective, when something fails, they'll fix it. And that fix may get baked back into their environment. But that fix often is challenged to get back upstream into either the OpenStack project or into the vendor that's selling the technology. The service provider model. And this is what's made public clouds, in my opinion, largely as successful as they've been. Every time something fails in a service provider model, that fix goes back into the same product that's distributed to every customer. So every cloud failure that we have in our managed model, that fix goes out to every other customer. So every installation we have makes every installation more reliable, more successful, more scalable. And you don't get that when it's only your organization focused on, on that component. So, uh, that that's my thoughts on that topic. Great question, though. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're in the of the OpenStack talk, and one of the things I'm happy with is some hot takes on it. So this is the first time. Greg, would you guys talk about that this time? Yeah, so the question was, uh, yesterday we had a talk around uh, uh, OpenStack's future and, and a collision with VMware. Um, so I can't remember what the panelists said, but my, my perspective was that I think they are on a collision course. And not necessarily OpenStack becoming sort of the VMware replacement. But if you look at where customers are going, where the market's going, that's in cloud native applications. And cloud applications, cloud native applications need a cloud platform to operate on. And VMware recognizes that. OpenStack recognizes that. And so ultimately, we're going to end up building similar solutions to solve the same problem. Now, VMware's business isn't going away, right? They're not getting, VMware's not getting ripped out of every installation that exists. But I think that's a declining business, because I think the next generation of applications that we're writing are being written against these next generation technologies. I also don't think it makes sense for OpenStack to focus on 
replacing that VMware installation because if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? If you go into an organization, you say, even if you say, I've got free VMware, you've just got to move everything from the VMware you have to this free VMware that's exactly the same, it has all the same functions, uh, but you've got to move everything. What does that take? It takes time. Do we have any time? No, nobody has any time, right? So nobody's going to do that. People move things because they're broken uh, or they're making something new. Uh, and if we focus on what's already there in the marketplace as the OpenStack community versus what's coming, I think we're, we're doomed for failure. But if we focus on that next generation application platform, we build all the things in that make containers a first rate citizen, that make bare metal management a first rate citizen, that make VM management, and we get that service catalog uh, spun up, and we're seeing that with the Big Ten initiative, now we've got a platform that's ready for those next generation applications. That's my take. So the question was, do I see a way to make uh, upgrades from one release to another easier? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I think over time, all of these pieces get easier, right? So where installation was once a challenge, that's become an, an easier uh, problem. Where upgrades are once a challenge, every release of OpenStack that comes out has solved some of, some of that hurdle. Uh, but at the same time, we're adding additional complexity, and each of those new projects has its own round of, of upgrade challenges. So where today may become easier to upgrade Nova, all of those, those new initiatives haven't reached that same point of maturity in the spectrum. Uh, and so it, it's sort of, we're, it's the dog chasing a tail to some extent. We're going to continue to add services, yet each of those services will lack maturity that the, the uh, services that have been there have. Uh, and, and so I, I don't know if we ever sort of reach a point where it's, it's uh, push button simple. Did I part two say something? Yeah. yeah. Do you want, do you, but yeah, but you have to speak in the microphone. All right. Introduce yourself. There you go. Hi, I'm Sean Roberts. Um, so I work in the um, part of the product team, um, which is a, I guess it's a working group now. So um, but one of the things, uh, I'll, I'll just generally say tagging is a general thing. There's actually two versions right now that's being worked out. But ge in general, tagging is, is trying to approach the, um, initially there's uh, stable release tags. But for other things of uh, interoperability style tags and tags that show levels of maturity in the project and, um, well, just leave it there in the, in the project itself. Um, I think over time as that starts filtering through all the different projects and people get more used to not only accepting that in the projects but also in um, downstream <coughs> products that are based on that, um, I think you'll get more of that. That the, I'm not sure who I'm talking to. but. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think over the next couple of um, uh, release, release cycles, you'll start to get the language will start to change over um, the projects that have accomplished that upgradability success will have the mature that some tag of uh, tag that means maturity. I don't know if we'll actually say maturity, but um, uh, so you'll see that over the next couple of releases. It's happening now. So the, the project navigator actually has a sort of maturity rating. So it it does. Yeah, it's yeah. true. So I think we'll, yeah, and we'll see that. Yep. And again, I think that the other key piece there is you don't have to use all the pieces, right? Just because they're in OpenStack doesn't mean you have to deploy all of them. So certainly, uh, if you just use the core primitives, uh, compute, network, storage, uh, those those will get better. They will get more stable. They will be easier to operate over time. Uh, ab absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, that is the, is that the container? Yeah, the yes, uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it's absolutely a great idea. Um, we experimented with it about a year ago before the project was created. We ran into some challenges in the way uh, some of the OpenStack projects like Neutron and Cinder need to talk to the kernels. Uh, so there, there are some things to figure out there. Uh, but I think that process certainly plays a, uh, or, or that concept certainly plays a material uh, role in, in making upgrades uh, more easier, and even even making installation and distribution of, of OpenStack easier. I think it's a great great initiative. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, thank you all for spending some time with me this morning. Look forward to seeing many of you around this uh, conference this week, and thank you very much.